but this will be the final lesson on the Thessalonians for now. And then we're going to move on to some, I guess we can call it deeper things. Um, we're not going to do any, any review tonight. I feel like we, we got a lot accomplished last week. We're just going to get right into it because I have, when we get to the summary, because what I want to do is I want to finish the letter and I want to get to the summary. And what I did with the summary uh, is I just combined everything that we have talked about, all of Paul's instructions, all the things that he talked about when he came in, how they should conduct themselves, how he conducted himself and expected them to conduct themselves. Um, so we're just going to tie all those things together and we're going to look at it from how Paul was speaking to them, but I'm going to speak to you in the way Paul would instruct us. Let's see. So let's go ahead and get started. We are on chapter 5. Verse 16. First Thessalonians 5, 16. So as we finished last week, it was Paul giving instruction from verse 11 through verse 15. And we are just continuing his instruction as he ends the letter. In verse 16, he says, rejoice evermore. Now, we talked about last week the word Godspeed. Y'all remember that? Godspeed. This is the same word for rejoice. Same exact word we talked about. And he says to rejoice evermore. In 2 Corinthians 6.10... Paul says, by honor, we'll start at verse 8, by honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report, as deceivers and yet true, as unknown and yet well known, as dying, and behold, we live, as chastened and not killed, as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing, as poor, yet making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing all things. Paul wanted to make sure that they knew that no matter what situation they were going through, and he told this to everybody, whether in sorrow, whether in prison, whether it doesn't matter what situation you're in, you should rejoice evermore because we have attained salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. So that's pretty self-explanatory. Verse 17, pray without ceasing. This will be the third week that we've come across pray without ceasing. And I just want to and we've explained it, what Paul meant by pray without ceasing. But I want to let you know what Matthew Henry has to say about it. Who knows who Matthew, Matthew Henry is? Anybody ever heard of Matthew Henry? 1600s, 1700s, he was a theologian, commentator. Uh, Charles Spurgeon said this about Matthew Henry. He said, first among the mighty for general usefulness. We are bound to mention the man whose name is a household word, Matthew Henry. He is most pious and pithy, sound and sensible, suggestive and sober, terse and trustworthy. Charles Spurgeon enjoyed reading Matthew Henry's commentaries. And if that tells you anything, if you've ever heard Charles Spurgeon, he was a brilliant, brilliant man and a great preacher, prince of preachers. And he read Matthew Henry. So I'll just let you know how important Matthew Henry was in church history. Matthew Henry had to say about pray without ceasing. And you can come up here and look at this if you can't see it. But I wrote the verse up there or the uh, quote. He says, the meaning is not that men should do nothing but pray, but that nothing else we do should hinder prayer in its proper season. Prayer will help forward and not hinder all other lawful business and every good work. So we talked about being in a prayerful state of mind at all times. It doesn't matter where we're at. There should be no reason why we should not be uh, have a heart and uh, a mind, spirit to pray everywhere, we're, everywhere we are. And Matthew Henry is saying the same thing. Verse 18. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Now I want to read a testimony 
an actual story, an eyewitness account that goes along with this verse. In everything, give thanks. Who has heard of Polycarp? Heard of Polycarp? Him. Polycarp was a direct disciple. the Apostle John Polycarp. And I want to read his, uh, his martyrdom. And the reason I want to read this is because it goes right along with this verse. So where I got this from, this is a, an eyewitness account. It says the text of this story is around 160 AD. Uh, Polycarp was the bishop of the church in Smyrna. <coughs> uh, the account is from a letter from an eyewitness to other churches in the area. The header of the letter says, we are writing you brothers, brothers with an account of the martyrs, especially the blessed Polycarp, whose death brought the persecution to a close. Almost all the events that led up to it revealed to be another martyrdom in the divine pattern that we see in the gospel. For he waited for his betrayal, just like the Lord did, so that we might follow him in looking out for the needs of others as well as, well as ourselves. True love desires not only one's own salvation, but the salvation of all of our brothers. Now, Polycarp uh, was a man who used to, if you don't know anything about it, he was a man who used to buy slaves. And he would bring them into his house, and they would be his own. And he would treat them like sons and daughters, and he had a bunch of them. And he would get them, you know, Polycarp, one of his main, there's a movie out, you can watch it, it's an awesome movie. It's called Polycarp. He, was, he would rewrite the letters, all these letters, and he would have a runner, one of his boys or one of his, they would run these things to the churches. And they would come back and he would have another one written and he'd hand it to them and they were running these scrolls to the churches. And one of his slaves that he bought was a, a kid named Germanicus. And they say that Polycarp was the first martyr after the apostles. But Germanicus was actually the first martyr. And Germanicus was fed to the lions. And it said that um, Germanicus walked, when, he, when they put him in the, the, uh, the Agon, when they put him in the Colosseum or wherever they had the little place for the games, when they put him in there, he actually walked to the lions. He didn't let the lions come to him. So it was, a, it was a pretty amazing thing. So Polycarp's leadership and his, his ability to you know, teach him the word had Germanicus grounded in it as well. But as this continues on uh, in Smyrna, the government is coming after him. The Roman government is coming after him. And so I want to, Polycarp has a vision before all that his martyrdom happens. And he says, this is the account. When we heard about this, the undoubtable Polycarp was not in the least upset and was happy to stay in the city. But eventually he was persuaded to leave. He went to friends in the nearby country, where as usual, he spent the whole time, day and night, in prayer for all people and for the churches throughout the world. Three days before he was arrested, while he was praying, he had a vision of a pillow under his head in flames. He said prophetically to those who were with him, I will be burnt alive. Those who were looking for him were coming near, so he left to another house. They immediately followed him, and when they could not find him, they seized two young men from his own household and tortured them into confession. The sheriff called Herod was impatient to bring Polycarp to the stadium so that he might fulfill his special role to share the sufferings of Christ while those who betrayed him would be punished like Judas. The police and horsemen came with young men at supper time on a Friday with their usual weapons at, as in coming out as a, as a robber. That evening, they found him lying in the upper room of a cottage. They, he could have escaped, but he refused, saying, God's will be done. When he heard that they had come, he went down and spoke with them. They were amazed at his age and steadfastness. And some of them said, why did we go to so much trouble to capture a man like this? Immediately, he called for food and drink for them and asked for an hour to pray un uninterrupted. They agreed, and he stood and prayed, so full of the grace of God that he could not stop for two hours. <coughs> the men were astounded 
and many of them regretted coming to arrest such a godly and venerable old man. When he finished praying, they put him on a donkey and took him to the, into the city. As Polycarp was being taken into the arena, <coughs> excuse me, a voice came from heaven saying, Be strong, Polycarp, and play the man. The one saw, or no one saw who was speaking, but our brothers who were there heard the voice. When the crowd heard that Polycarp had been captured, they were in an uproar. The proconsul asked him whether he was Polycarp. On hearing that, he said, or hearing that he was, he tried to persuade him to apostatize, saying, Have respect for your old age, swear by the fortune of Caesar, repent, <coughs> and say, Down with the atheists. Polycarp looked grimly at the wicked heathen multitude in the stadium, gestured toward them, and said, Down with the atheists. Swear, urged the proconsul, reproach Christ, and I will set you free. Eighty-six years old have I served him, Polycarp declared, and he has done no wrong to me. How can I blaspheme my king and my savior? And the proconsul said, I have wild animals here. I will throw you to them if you do not, do not repent. Call them, Polycarp replied. It is unthinkable for me to repent from what is good to turn to what is evil. I will be glad, though to be changed from evil to righteousness. If you despise the animals, I will have you burned, says the proconsul. You threaten me with fire which burns for an hour and is then extinguished. But you know nothing of the fire of the coming judgment and eternal punishment reserved for the ungodly. Why are you waiting? Bring on whatever you want, Polycarp said. It was all done in the time it takes to tell. The crowd collected wood and bundles of sticks <clears throat> from the shops and public baths. The Jews, as usual, were keen to help. When the pile was ready, Polycarp took off his outer clothes, undid his belt, and tried to take off his sandals, something he was not used to, uh, as the faithful always raced to do it for him, each wanting to be the one that touched his skin. This is how good his life was. But when they went to fix him with nails to the post, he said, Leave me as I am, for he that gives me strength to endure the fire will enable me not to struggle without the help of your nails. So they simply bound him with his hands behind him like a distinguished ram chosen from a great flock to sacrifice. Ready to be accepted, burnt offering to God, he looked up to heaven and said this, O Lord God Almighty, the Father of your beloved and blessed Son, Jesus Christ, by whom we have received knowledge of you, the God of angels, power, and every creature, <clears throat> and of all the righteous who live before you, I give you thanks that you count me worthy to be numbered among your martyrs, sharing the cup of Christ and the resurrection to eternal life, both of soul and body, through the immortality of the Holy Spirit. May I be received this day as an acceptable sacrifice, as you, the true God, have predestined, revealed to me, and now fulfilled I praise you for all these things. I bless you and glorify you along with the everlasting Jesus Christ, your blessed Son. To you, with him, through the Holy Ghost, be glory both forever and ever. Amen. Then the fire was lit and the flame blazed furiously. We who were privileged to witness it saw a great miracle. And this is why we have been preserved to tell the story. The fire shaped itself into a form of an ark. Like the sail of a ship when it filled in the wind, when it was filled in the wind, and formed a circle around the body of the martyr. Inside it, he looked not like flesh that is burnt, but like bread that is baked, or gold and silver glowing in the furnace. And we smelled a sweet scent like frankincense and some precious spices. That's an account, an eyewitness account. The reason I read that. Because it goes along with in everything give thanks. Polycarp is at the post fixing to be burned alive. And he says, I thank you, O Lord, for allowing me to be a martyr for you. Can we say that today? It's hard for us to think about that because none of us have been in that situation. Yes. 
well, you know, what we go through in life, we don't have to be thankful for what we go through, but we got to be thankful, you know, you know, not in it, but for it, for the end results, you know, when God just gives the blessings. Mm -hmm. You know, for this is the will of God in Jesus Christ, you know. I mean, whether good or bad, we are there for a reason. We're there for a reason. And it's an amazing thing. I like to read testimonies like that. I like to read um, about, I mean, it's a martyrdom, people who died for the faith, the testimony of Jesus Christ. But I like to read those because it brings me to reality. And it brings me to a place where when I read this, I say, this is right. This is correct. And the men before me and the women before me have stuck to this, you know, and it helps us as a church to read things like this that builds our faith. So let's continue on. Quench not the spirit, verse 19. Verse 19 and 20 are connected, and I'll tell you why they're connected here in a minute. Quench not the spirit. Who thinks that they know what that means? Not to quench the spirit. To resist, uh, to resist what God has for okay. us to do. Okay. Anybody else? Yes. Um, normally when I hear uh, to quench, that like means to extinguish. Yep. Uh, so it's talking about not allowing like the spirit of God to be extinguished uh, because you just, you stop caring. Okay. Who knows, anybody ever read the, it's going well, the Cambridge Commentary? Anybody? There's a website. Some of you don't have the internet, but I'm going to write it down. Yeah. Scriptureworkshop.com. It's got old commentaries that you can go on there and research and look. Well, the Cambridge Commentary has every book in the Bible, and it breaks it down verse by verse. And I like, I like to read it myself and pray about it and ask God to show me it, but then I like to go back and see what they have to say as well. These are brilliant men who, who wrote on these things. The word for quench is spenumi. Spenumi. And it does mean to extinguish or to stifle. That's exactly what it means. It's the same word in Mark 9, 48, when the Lord Jesus talks about the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. It's not going to be extinguished. It's going to be forever. It's the same word that's in Ephesians 6, 6. When Paul is talking about quenching to put on the full armor of God so that we can quench the fiery darts of the wicked. Same exact word, to stifle those. So, when we talk about despise not prophesying, the prophesies, remember that Paul is talking to the Thessalonians in the second century, or the, the first century. And as he's talking to these people, you have to realize the context. Okay? During this time, if I wrote these verses up here and you can check these out. 1 Corinthians 12, 10, 14, 1 through 5, and Romans 12, 6. Shows you that the gifts of the Spirit at this time in the first century church were ordinary. There was tongues being spoken. There was prophesying going on. There was miracles happening. People being raised from the dead. Right? People were seeing these things. Things that we, we don't see today. So... There was a lot of things going on and a lot of things were ordinary. But Paul is saying despise not prophesying and to quench not the spirit. This is what Cambridge commentary has to say about it. It says early Christians were familiar with the manifestation of the gifts. They were ordinary. You can go back to those verses and check. But it was liable to be abused or simulated. And this is why John, 1 John 4, 1 says to test the spirits, to make sure that they're of God. Because the gifts, as we see today with the ba 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 the tongues, right? People try to simulate tongues and by their own flesh to make people, either to deceive people or to get money out of them or get people to think that they're in the spirit. But it's false. It's abused. They abuse it. And so the same thing was happening back then. People were trying to deceive people. And so John and Paul make sure that they say to prove everything, test the spirits, make sure they're from God. So 
the, uh, let's see, it says, there had been a sort of fanatical element that had appeared to be mingled with the prophesyings. So as people would stand up and prophesy in the church, uh, there was this fanatical element going on within it, and it was causing the sober-minded people to be offended at it. So, you know, people were going, wait a minute, this is not, this is not right. And so it caused them to distrust the prophecy itself, you see, because, the, because of this fanaticism going on. And so between these two verses here, there's a double, there's a double warning, a double caution. It says, contempt for this gift of the Holy Spirit must grieve him and limit his action. Contempt for it. So people not or people distrusting it must grieve the Holy Spirit. You see, the spirit all through the scripture is known as a fire, right? So what Paul is saying is despise not prophesies, despise not the Holy Spirit prophesying through a man as he stands up. But make sure that you prove all things, but don't despise this because it's going to grieve the Holy Spirit and it's going to quench the spirit in the church. You see? And then, of course, all through Scripture, we just said that the Holy Spirit is like a fire. And so we don't have much experience with this where somebody stands up in the church and starts prophesying the future or saying, you know, things of God uh, that may happen. But they had a lot of it going on then. And he was just telling them, don't despise the gifts of God. If you do, it's going to quench the spirit. And it's not going to allow the spirit to move. And that's why those two verses go together. It's verse 21. Prove all things. Hold fast to that which is good. So, can anyone... Give me an example of a religion or a god or gods in history that they've researched or read about that have told their followers to prove them, to test me. Do y'all think Allah has ever told the Muslims, test me, find out if I'm true, prove me? Or do you think Krishna and the Hindu and the 300 million gods that they got over there, that all of them have ever come down and said, test me and prove me to see if I'm true. I want to give you an example of Elijah trying to get the prophets of Baal to prove Baal, 1 Kings 18, right? Mm -hmm. And it was actually a funny story because Elijah says, this is what we're going to do. I want you to build an altar. I want you to call Baal, 450 prophets out there. I want all of you to cry out to Baal and see if he answers you. And so Elijah was getting those prophets of Baal to test Baal, prove he's true, right? Whoever calls down, whoever's God brings fire down from heaven and licks up, you know. And he actually makes a funny statement while they're out there whipping themselves and crying out to Baal. He says, is he asleep? What's wrong with him? Is he asleep? Maybe he's gone somewhere. You know, in biblical terms, you know, you have to read into it. So, but it's a funny story. But God, our God, the one true God, tells Malachi about the storehouses. And he says, you know what? Fill these storehouses, the 10%, it's the tithing 10%. Fill them up and I'll give you blessings that will rain down from heaven. Prove me and see what happens. You see? Test me. See if I'm true. And I don't know of any other God, little G's, or any other religion, any other faith, any other deity in the world who's ever presented himself demonically, I guess. Our God is the only one in the scripture who says, prove me. And Paul is reminding them to prove all things. Now, proving all things... This is an interesting quote here. It says, instead of accepting or rejecting wholesale, what is addressed to you, use your judgment, learn to discriminate, sift the wheat from the chaff, ask God for a discerning spirit. This is one of the major issues of today. Judgment, discernment, discrimination, 
all these words are rejected as good as as uh, bigoted things. But in reality, these are all good things. We're supposed to discriminate. We are supposed to. Discrimination is nothing but separating, separating things. And so it's important that we do ask God for a discerning spirit because we must test the spirits. It's getting rampant today, and this is one of the things we're going to talk about next week. <coughs> verse 23. Or verse 22. Abstain from all appearance of evil. Verse 23. And that the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We talked last week about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We talked that there are many different views about the coming of the Lord. But right here, he's talking about parousia, the physical coming. And he's saying that uh, he's, he's, he's hoping that they will be sanctified wholly in body, spirit, and soul. If you know anything about the Jews, the way they broke down the human uh, body, soul, and spirit, triune being, we are a triune being, same as the image that we're in, created in the image of God, was a triune being. And we read in verse, or chapter 4 a couple weeks ago about sanctification and the temple and how those things work out. But what he's telling you here is he's breaking down... He's not telling you these things uh, about them. He's saying your whole humanity, right? Instead of saying, I hope that you're sanctified wholly and that you are preserved. He's actually going live, you know, body and soul and spirit. He's making sure to complete the human being and break it down in that way. And I just wrote right here that the spirit is that which is closest to God. That's what the body is. Is the vessel that houses your true self. And your soul is the living personality, the breath of life. So he's making sure to hit on all those points to make sure they understand how he feels about them being sanctified holy at the coming of the Lord Jesus. Faithful is he that calleth you who always will do it. And I wrote a couple of verses up there, Deuteronomy 7 9. I'll turn there. Just to talk about God's faithfulness. Know therefore that the Lord thy God, he is God, the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love him and keep his commandment to a thousand generations. And then 1 Corinthians 1 9 says that God is faithful. And this is the closing. Brethren, pray for us. Greet all the brethren with a holy kiss. A holy kiss was just, that was the customary thing. Today, what do we do? We shake hands and then we hug. So it's a sign of affection. They gave a holy kiss. Oh, I think uh, I think a lot of some people would be offended today if, if another man was to come up and kiss you on the cheek. You know, <laughs> <laughs> it might be offensive today. You know, but back then that was it was just customary. They'd kiss each other off. You know. <laughs> so, you can shake my hand. I'll be just fine. <laughs> but, ending here, I charge you by the Lord that this epistle be read unto all the holy brethren. So he wants to make sure that everybody hears this instruction. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. And so, as we end it in the letter, um, a lot of the things at the end, as he's given instruction, we've covered through the previous Bible studies. So don't render evil to any man. We've covered a lot of that. And so that's why I kind of went through it um, a little bit quickly. But as we summarize this letter, I just want you to listen. And um, I'm going to go over, I read this again two or three times last night. And I was trying to pick out everything. You know, I didn't look at my notes or anything like that. I just tried to pick out everything that we have talked about. And I... Put it in a way that can be addressed to you uh, as Paul was addressing it to the Thessalonians. So, to summarize, I, put, I titled it 
for the summary, the attributes of the Thessalonian church. And so as we listen to this, ponder and meditate on whether, uh, as long as you've been going here or if you're visiting here or uh, how long you've been a Christian and you've been around other believers, think about, is this me? Is this the church today? Is this the body of Christ? All right? So, we are to be workers of faith. And I'm not going to explain these things because we went, we went over them. But just, just listen to me. We're to be workers of faith. We are to labor in love towards one another. And all those throughout Macedonia, I put. But for us, it would be all those brethren and sisters who are in our area. We are to be patient in trial and tribulation. We are to be waiting obsessively on the coming of the Lord. We are to receive the gospel with much assurance and knowing that it's absolutely true and knowing that it's going to come with much affliction. We are to be filled with joy in the Holy Ghost. We are to set the example for all the other churches, all the other believers, and the world. We are to let our faith and belief in the word of God sound out like a trumpet through the whole land. We are to be completely turned from our former conversation with the world. And for them, it was paganism and idol worship. And for us, it's the same thing, just in different terms. We all, we all have uh, had our conversation with the devil, whether it's alcohol or it's drugs or it's, you know, fornication or whatever the case may be. Some people murder. You see, Paul was, he, he murdered people. So everybody has had their conversation. And he's telling you to be completely turned. That's called repent. We are to be as Paul uh, correctly taught how to conduct ourselves. And this is how he taught to conduct themselves. As he came into the city, he was a walking example of how they should conduct themselves. They should conduct themselves without deceit or guile, not deceiving people. They are to conduct themselves with cleanness. They shouldn't be men pleasers, but God pleasers. They should preach the word in boldness. We should preach the bold word in boldness. We should speak plainly, not flattering people with soft words and fair speeches. We should not be desiring other people's affections, being covetousness, or, uh, to covet other people's things. We should not seek our own glory. We should be gentle and affectionate. We should be holy and just and unblameable and to walk honestly in the world. We should exhort and comfort and charge one another. We should walk worthy of God. We should give thanks to God without ceasing. We should understand that tribulation and suffering are part of the Christian life. We should rejoice and desire for others to be able to stand in front of the Lord at his coming. Not just yourself. It's about other people too. We should hold fast to that which is good. We should exercise faith and charity and remembrance to those who have given us the word of God. Think about that. Is it in your thought that maybe when you were a teenager, somebody preached you the word of God and you remember them in your prayers and your thoughts? Because they're the ones that God used to penetrate your heart with the word of God. You see? We should be, we should pray day and night without ceasing. We should increase and abound in love towards one another and towards all men. We should abound more and more as to, walk, as to the walking of the commandments of God. We should stay away from fornication, which is illicit sexual acts. We should possess this vessel, this body, in honor because we are the temple of God. We should stay away from lustful, debaucherous acts of sexual pleasure. We should not defraud our brother or sister. We should have brotherly love or sisterly love to all the brethren. We should be diligent to live a quiet life. We should conduct our own business 
and not be in other people's business. It's an important thing. Gossip starts like that. Amen. We should work and provide for our families. We should have no sorrow for those who have died before us in the Lord, knowing that you will see them again. We should be comforted and comfort those who are sorrowful and let them know that the Lord is coming soon and is bringing all of us with him. We should be watchful for the coming of the Lord. We should not be wrathful, but obtain salvation. We should edify, building up one another. We should esteem those who watch over our souls and teach us and preach and, and admonish the word to us. We should pray for them unceasingly. We should love them for their great hard work. So, Bert Baker, all these preachers who have come in here and put their work and time into preaching the word of God to you. We should hold them, we should esteem them very high and love them and try to take care of them as much as we can. We should have peace among each other. We talked about that last week. That is a, that's one of the big ones. Because in our heart, do we really have peace with one another? We can come here and act. We can put on a face, put on a mask. Amen. But the reality is that a lot of people don't have peace with each other. And that's not of God. We should warn them that are unruly. We should comfort the feeble-minded, those who wear their heart on their sleeve. We should support the weak. There are many Christians who, we talked about this last week too, that, that are just not as strong as some other people. And we should lift them up and bring them alongside. We should be patient with each other. We should not repay anyone with evil deeds. We should follow what is good and rejoice from now on. We should never reject the gifts of God or suppress the Holy Spirit in the church. We should prove all things, test all spirits. Be a Berean. We should stay away from all evil things. We should pray for each other and read the word of God to each other always. That is the summary of the first letter of the Thessalonians. And let me tell you, as we have said over the last couple of weeks, Paul put more instruction into these letters, especially into that first one, than you'll get out of any of the other letters. Because it's all in one central spot. We can get teaching and instruction of how not to be in many of the other letters because those a lot of the other churches were carnal. Right? So he was like, don't, you know, you don't need to do this. But in a lot of ways, he was telling them, you are doing these things. You are doing good. He was encouraging them. But as we read it, we're being instructed by it. You see? So, I hope you guys enjoyed this study. It's been a wonderful study for me. I know this was shorter tonight, but this was the summary portion of it uh, anyway. So next week, I hope you all come back because we have going to do a, an intense study on this one right here. <laughs> See, the reason we're going to do a study on that word right there is because we are living in a time um, like never before. This age today is more deceived than any other age and any other generation that's ever lived on the face of the earth. Amen. This is my opinion. Based on the things I read, the old stuff that I read, based on the word of God, there was a lot of debaucherous things going on. There was men creeping in unawares, deceiving people back in that day as well. And they've been doing it the whole time. And we're going to see some very interesting things in the Old Testament as well of how people were being deceived. It's happened since the beginning, since the garden. Satan, the serpent, deceived Adam and Eve. But we're going to break down words again. We're going to get in here and break them down again to show you exactly what's going on. Um, but there is a ton of information about being deceived and about the end times, how the Lord Jesus uh, expresses the first thing that he expresses when his disciples say, what is the sign of you coming back? 
what can we look for? The first thing that he says is make sure that you're not deceived. That was the first thing before the, the you know, uh, the sun going dark and the moon, you know, all that stuff is afterwards. Wars and rumors of wars is after being deceived. So the period of deception is upon us. And it's the worst it's ever been. So I just want to go through that. I want to break that down because we need to be watchful. And we need to be waiting. And we need to be warning. Remember the word admonish. There are people who don't come here on Wednesday night. There are people who don't get this word. They don't get it in this way that we get it on Wednesday night. Not to say that the preaching is not good. It is good. It's from God. But it's different. We are breaking things down on the board and the Greek and all these things so you can see uh, a much clearer picture of what's going on in the world. And we're going to see it. And it's going to astonish you. I guarantee you it's going to astonish you. Are there any questions? No, but I do want to share something. Yes. Bill asked for two people to be prayed for in Spain. One is Johnny. Okay. And the other one is Hamas. It's with the J, but he said it was H-A-M-A-S. Hamas and Johnny. Uh, Hamas was the couple that we saw on screen here, the man and woman. Oh, yeah. They're separated. But they still have access to talk to her and work with her. But they and Bill said, please keep her in him in your prayers. Okay. Yeah. Any other comments? Rose. Rose. Family? Rose Rose Mary. Oh, Rosemary. She's coming home tomorrow. And then she's gonna have physical therapy at three rivers. Where's she? She has a herniated disc in her back. Any other comments? Yeah. Questions? Yes. Um, just a prayer request. I was at the post office this afternoon, and one of the workers there <sighs> broke her thumb, and she is probably looking at surgery coming up. Her name is it's T E A S H A. Questions, comments, concerns. Uh, I do want to thank you for the text. Uh, Becky sent me a text. Was it yesterday, right? I'm yesterday. Here. Yeah, she sent me a text and told me that I was a bad person and just, <laughs> you just, you just, you just told us all wrong. Remember, I told you uh, <laughs> if you ever found something on the board that was not correct, look me up, and make sure that I'm right. Call me and text me and let me know. And she did. She said one of the verses you wrote up there for the coming of the Lord was wrong. And uh, she corrected me and gave me the right verse. So, <laughs> <laughs> so any, anything other about the letters of the Thessalonians? Any comments? Any testimonies? All right. Tim, would you, I wrote this down. Would you mind praying for us? Pray to what? Pray over these people. Oh, okay. Pray for the service in the next week. Johnny. Yeah. Dear Heavenly Father, we just come to you this evening to thank you for the teaching that we learned tonight. We ask that we soak it in and concentrate on it. Let it hit our hearts. I thank for each and every one that's here tonight. Bless this church. Bless the people that belong to it. We pray for these people that are on this prayer list. Lord. I ask that you uplift them. Be with each and every one, whatever their situation is. Just be with that situation, Lord. I just ask that you put your holiness upon this, your blessing upon this, and we give it to you, Lord. We give this day to you. And we just thank you for what we can learn. Just feed us more, Lord. Let us understand your word more. And let us give our week to you, Lord. And let us uh, share the gospel with somebody this week. 
and let them know how much Jesus loves them. We just thank you for this day. We thank you for uh, Robbie that the, he teaches a, a well study and that uh, we can contribute from it, Father. And we just thank you for it, Lord, and just give this day to you and ask that you bless it. In Jesus' most precious name, amen. amen.